Good evening. It is time to begin our Wednesday night. <laughs> we, uh, this is our last final summer series, so we are looking forward to that. Uh, let's kick this off with a couple of songs. We have come to this house and gathered in his name.
see all of you here tonight for this final evening of our summer series. And uh, just a couple of updates for you before I introduce Billy. Uh, we learned this afternoon that Jim Lee was at St. Francis Hospital uh, with possible uh, stroke. And so they were going to be doing an MRI and some other tests. So continue to pray for Jim. And uh, Chris Carter continues dialysis at St. Francis. A kidney biopsy was done yesterday, and he anticipates results from that biopsy tomorrow. So continue to pray for him as he undergoes all of that, that treatment. As I shared with you, I guess last Wednesday night, or maybe even Sunday evening, I guess it was, uh, after the Affirming the Faith seminar in 2022, I had the opportunity to go spend the rest of the weekend with the uh, church in Sayre, Oklahoma. And part of the many blessings of that opportunity for me was to meet Billy and Shayla and Caleb and get acquainted with them and their family and, and their ministry there. Uh, Billy and Shayla have been married since 2000. They are blessed with their son, Caleb, who was born in 2013. Billy grew up first in Maysville, Oklahoma, and then Mustang, Oklahoma, where he ultimately graduated from high school. Uh, he taught and coached in public schools and private schools early in his uh, career, and then they entered full-time ministry in 2005 in Fort Cobb, Oklahoma, with the Fort Cobb Church of Christ, and have been there in Sayers since 2012. And I was just so impressed with the congregation there, the amount of young families that they had, young families that were driving from a broad geographic area just to be a part of that congregation. And a big part of that is uh, the leadership that they have there. And uh, that includes Billy's ministry and, and leadership and that of his family. Uh, they enjoy spending time together watching the OU Sooners and the Atlanta Braves. And I love that combination. The Braves are having a killer season uh, this season and they feel blessed to serve in the kingdom of God. So we're grateful that Billy had a safe drive here. He is gonna be driving home tonight after uh, the service, which is quite a drive. So pray for him while he's on the road and that he has a safe return back to his family. Billy, come on up and let's pray together and we look forward to your message. Father, thank you so much for the safe travel that, that you've granted our, our brother Billy. Father, thank you for him and Shayla and Caleb, for their family, their commitment, their uh, love for your people in, in Sayre and the effective ministry that, that you are accomplishing through them there. Father, thank you for his willingness uh, to come this distance. Thank you for his preparation and his, his prayer and just the commitment of time in, in being away tonight. And Father, we do pray for him a safe journey home. And please speak to our minds, our hearts through him tonight. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Tim. Good evening. If you would open your Bibles to John chapter 3, I just want to say it is an honor, a privilege, and a pleasure to be with you tonight. Appreciate Tim, and the elders, and the opportunity to be part of your summer series and enjoy the, um, the supper with Tim and with Scott. Uh, he did mention, you know, he was in uh, Sayre back a couple years ago after affirming the faith. He kind of drew the short end of the straw. We're about two hours. Uh, west of Oklahoma City, and every year at Affirming the Faith, there's one guy that kind of gets that short end of the straw as one of the kind of supporting congregations of Affirming the Faith, so I uh, really appreciate Tim coming out, and, and it, the, that feeling's mutual. It was a pleasure to get to, to know him a little bit, and uh, I know you guys are thankful to have him and his family here with you, and I know the Lord is doing wonderful things uh, through you guys. <clears throat> Before... Uh, before we get into the lesson, I would like to, to pray with you too as well. Let's pray. Father, I pray you help us tonight in the things we say, that they be pleasing to you. I thank you for this, um, this church family, your people in this place, and for Tim and, Father, the, um, the work that you're doing here with all the, your saints. And I pray you continue to bless them. Be with those, Father, that are in need um, physically. I pray you be with those also that are in need spiritually and that you will help use these um, brothers and sisters in Christ, to meet their needs. Father, we love you, and we thank you that you love us, and that you've got an eternal home prepared, and we pray you will help us to never lose sight of that. Help us to always remember that promise, and help us, Father, to always be looking for ways to share that with others. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's 2009. If I can get the clicker to work right. 
Uh, you may recognize that, that face. I don't know how many of you recognize that face, but 2009 national championship game against OU. Uh, Tim T Tebow was a quarterback for the Florida Gators. Uh, obviously, I, I wasn't a big Tebow fan. I'm probably a little more fan of Tebow now. Um, I don't necessarily agree with all of his doctrine, but he's a man that is willing to share what he believes about the Lord. He's not afraid to talk about the Lord. But during that game, after the game, it, he mentioned something that had nothing to do with the football game. And he said that there was something really cool happened. And that is, during the game, 94 million people Googled John 3.16. Now, you know, John 3.16 is a verse that we would say probably the most popular or maybe the most well-known verse, or at least one of the most well-known verses uh, in Scripture. And it, it can be quoted by people that maybe don't even really read the Bible or know the Bible. But it is interesting that during that game, 94 million people Googled that to figure out, I guess, you know, what does John 3.16 say? Brian P. Stone is a professor of evangelism at Boston University School of Theology. He says this, born-again Christians started holding John 3.16 signs at stadiums back in the 1970s when games were, were being um, played more and more on television or televised more and more on, on TV. And they used that as a way to spread the gospel. A man by the name of Roland Stewart, I don't know how many of you have seen this guy, maybe you probably got to be over 40 or 45 to maybe remember that guy. But Roland Stewart showed up, showed up at hundreds of sporting events flashing a sign with John 3.16 or wearing the t-shirt that said John 3.16. He would position himself behind star players so that he would get on television showing that scripture, that verse. He even stood behind the medal stand at the Olympics. Now, Wikipedia, you know, you don't want to believe everything that Wikipedia says, but Wikipedia says this, that this is one of the most widely quoted verses from the Christian Bible. It would be called the most famous Bible verse of all time. It's the gospel in a nutshell. Martin Luther referenced it as the Bible in miniature. It, it doesn't mean, though, sometimes what everybody wants John 3.16 to mean. For us to understand what's being said in John 3.16, I think we've got to take it like any verse. We need to take it in context. And I don't think the intention of the Holy Spirit inspiring John was just to sum up all of salvation in one verse. Certainly it is about salvation. There, there, there is an aspect of that in this, and we need to understand that. But it's not just one verse and the only verse that we go to to explain salvation. John 3.16 it's really a part of a conversation that Jesus had with Nicodemus. So I want you to back up with me in John chapter 3. Remember Nicodemus, the ruler of the Jews? Um, <clears throat> he comes to Jesus at night. And then we see this in John chapter 3 and verse 2. This man came by Jesus or came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you've come from God as a teacher. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. And then look at what Jesus says in verse 3. Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And so Jesus says if a person is going to see the kingdom of God, he's got to what? He's got to be born again. He must be born again. Born anew, right? Born all over again, if you will. Or born maybe from above. Now, what does Nicodemus think? How in the world can I re-enter my mother's womb to be born? Again, he's thinking physically, isn't he? He's thinking along physical terms, and, and yet Jesus is thinking spiritually. And so in verse 5, notice what Jesus says. Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So if a person is to enter into the kingdom of God, they must be born of water and the Spirit. The water is where the cleansing of sin takes place, right? It's where you and I are united into the death, Romans chapter 6, of Jesus Christ. It's where we get into contact with the blood that's able to, to wash our sins away and make us pure and clean. So we need to be born in the water. And then the Spirit, just in part, I think, refers to the Spirit, maybe through the gospel that produces faith in the person that believes in the gospel. And that, that gospel begins to transform 
the way they think, and ultimately it changes the way we behave, the way we, we live on this earth. Paul describes it in 2 Corinthians 5, in verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed, and the new has come. Behold, he says, the new has come. We may come to Jesus as we are, and sometimes that's a, a slogan that you hear, and, and certainly that, that is true. We come to Jesus as we are, but when we get to Jesus or we get into Jesus, we, we don't stay as we are. And that begins when we're born into Christ and we're born of the water and the Spirit. And so Jesus teaches there, there has to be a spiritual birth to enter the kingdom of God. Then you get to John 3, verse 14. And Jesus introduces this, this illustration of Moses and the serpent that we read about in Numbers chapter 21, verses 4 through 9. Where most of you probably remember reading and studying this where God sends the serpents among the Israelites because they had murmured, they had groaned against God, grumbled against God. And these serpents bite many of the Israelites. Many of the Israelites die. God instructs Moses to craft this bronze serpent and to raise it up on a pole. And those who looked at the object in faith, what would happen? They would be healed. They would be saved. As Moses lifted up the serpent, so must the Son of Man, Jesus says, be lifted up. He must die on the cross so that all who look to Him in faith and believe on Him and that faith leads them to obedience. They may have eternal life in Christ. And so eternal life, it's only located in one place, isn't it? Eternal life is located in Jesus Christ. And a person enters into Christ when they're born of water and spirit. And so now, when you get to John 3, 16, what we see, I think, is, is Jesus giving some details, some specific details about this promise of eternal life. And so it's more than just, okay, i got to believe. We, we need a belief, right? But there is so much more to this passage. Think about what, how John 3.16 begins. Who provided the gift? For God, right? Right off the bat. For God. It's very obvious where eternal life comes from. So eternal life is God's idea. Eternal life originated with God. Th this verse is about God, isn't it? You know, all the Bible is about God, really. But, but this verse, it, it is about God, and it's about what He's done for man. Someone has said this, God is big enough to rule this mighty universe, yet He still can live within my heart. It's this God who has looked down on puny man. We can't miss that God has taken it upon Himself to provide a way for every man, woman, child, every sinner to have the opportunity of eternal life. It's His plan. It's God's plan. And as we're going to see in just a little bit, it's, it was His sacrifice. But yet we live in a world where we try to come up with our own plans for things. Whether it's how we live, whether it's how we're saved, whether it's how we worship. It, it, it was God's plan. And we're going to see exactly why it was His plan in just a few minutes. It was God who provided the promise of eternal life. Romans 5, verse 8. You know the passage. But God shows His love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God took the initiative to provide eternal life while we were still in our sin. We know who did it. Why? Why did God provide it? Well, for God so loved. Now, before we get into the, the love that God has for us, I want you to think about the love that our world has and what the world defines as love and how does the world see love. Typically, our culture... You have to earn love, right? You've got to do something for me, or, or you've got to love me first before I'm going to probably choose to love you. 
In other words, you, you, there's got to be something you can offer me before I love you. You've got to earn it. You've got to deserve it. And if you don't love me, then I have the right not to love you in return. And if you mistreat me, then I have the right to, to mistreat you. That's, that's kind of the, how the culture works that we live in. His name was Panfilo de Narve. Lived from 1470 to 1528. He was a Spanish conquistador. He spent his whole life in the conquest of lands and fortunes for his, his native country of Spain and also for, him, for himself. But it was said that he, as he was laying about to die that a priest came to him and, and asked him if he had forgiven all of his enemies. And his response was, I have no enemies. I've shot them all. <laughs> that's our culture, isn't it? And that may be the way of our culture, but that's not the way of God. Thankfully, right? Aren't you glad that God doesn't operate that way? And that's not the way of His people. And if we're His people, that, that's not our way, is it? And sometimes it, it is hard to, to remember that. It, and it's hard to live. We know it, but when somebody mistreats us or someone that we love, that, that's, that's hard, isn't it? Yeah, that's why we have to keep our eyes on the cross. And we've got to remember what Jesus says in the passage that we're looking at tonight. The term for love in John 3, 16, you, you understand, it's, it's that agape love, right? It's that love that's unconditional. It's the kind of love that has no strings attached. It's a love that has genuine interest for others and acts out of concern for others, whether that other person acts out of concern for you or not. Whether that, that person may despise you, but yet you still, as a child of God, choose to love that person. That's what God's love is all about in it. And that's what our love should be about in this world. And our world does need that kind of love desperately. Because our, our world and our culture has no idea what love is really about and what love should be. And that's why God's people need to show that love. So our world can see that and get a glimpse of our God, of our Lord. Vine's Dictionary of Bible Words describes this agape love in this way. It expresses the deep and constant love and interest of a perfect being towards entirely unworthy objects, producing and fostering a reverential love in them towards the giver and a practical love towards those who are partakers of the same. And... A desire to help others to seek the giver. That should describe us, right? That we love God because He first loved us. And we serve others because He first served us. We love each other because we have the same purpose, the same God, the same goal, the same future. And then we share that love with those around us because we want others to know that same God that we have been blessed to know. The Creator loved His creation too much to not provide an opportunity of eternal life. Ephesians chapter 2, Ephesians 2, verses 4 and 5. You're going to have to bear with me. I, I work with power. I usually use a PowerPoint on a Sunday morning, but sometimes I can get worked up and, and uh, it can lag behind a little bit. So I appreciate your, your patience with me. Ephesians chapter 2. In verses 4 and 5, But God, being rich in mercy because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you've been saved. Rich in mercy. And because of His great love, even when we were dead in our sins, He made us alive. He made us alive in Christ. For God so loved, that's why He provided eternal life. Well, who did God so love? God so loved the world. The object of God's love is the world. You know, there was a group of college students that were touring the slums of a city. And one of the girls in that group saw a little girl along the tour playing in dirt, and she was just covered in dirt. And so she, she asked the, the tour guide, how come the, the mother of that child does not clean her up? And the tour guide told her this, this, 
That girl's mother probably loves her, but she doesn't hate dirt. You hate dirt. You hate dirt, but you don't love her enough to go down there and clean her up. Until hate for dirt and love for that child are in the same person, that little girl is likely to remain just as she is. Thankfully, God doesn't just hate sin. He does hate sin, right? But also, thankfully, He loves the sinner. He loves man. And because He hates sin and He loves man, He's provided a way for us to be cleaned up from our sin. He's provided a way for us to have our sins washed away and to be found pure, holy, justified, sanctified, transformed, just before Him, righteous before Him through the blood of His Son. The word here for world means the inhabitants of the world, people. And that would be people not in fellowship with God. He reaches out and He loves the unlovable. He reaches out and allows those that maybe could care less about Him to have the opportunity to know Him and to choose to follow Him and to have salvation. Titus chapter 2 and verse 11, For the grace of God's appeared, bringing salvation for who? For all people. There are those who believe and teach predestination. God's determined to save some people and, and determined to... Uh, to send others into condemnation or send them to hell. And he does that just kind of randomly. And so because of that, then it doesn't really matter how you live on this earth. But yet if you read 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, and you believe that, then there's no way you can believe in predestination because he doesn't want anyone to perish. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you. Not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. He loves the whole world. And He wants all the world to have eternal life. But He's not going to force eternal life on anyone. He's not going to force eternity with Him on anyone. He's not going to force anyone to accept His offer of salvation. But the truth is, and the fact remains, God so loved the world well, what did God do because He loved the world? He gave His only Son. New King James says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. So God is the source of, of all good gifts. James 1.17, right? Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. So God's the source of all good gifts, and He's the source of the greatest gift that's ever been given. God put His love into action. He was under no obligation to give anything. He simply gave because He loved you. He loved me, and He loved the world. And giving is what God does. And God has always planned to give this gift he didn't send Jesus and things didn't go quite like the plan, so he got to come up with a new plan to, to make things work out better the next time. This is something God planned from the very beginning, right? God knew exactly what he would give for the world. Several centuries before Jesus ever came, in Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6, records for us these words, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. God knew what he would give long before he ever gave that gift. So the gift was by no accident. It was always part of his plan to save man. Several years ago, there was a 14-year-old girl named Laura Montero. Her appendix burst while she, <clears throat> she and her family were on a cruise ship off the Baja coast. The ship was hundreds of miles from help. And so they sent out a call for help looking for the nearest surgical unit. The USS Ronald Reagan was about 500 miles away from this cruise ship, and they were in the middle of training exercises. The USS Ronald Reagan turned around and steamed about 250 miles to get in helicopter transport range. And they sent the helicopter to pick up 
Laura Montero, bring her back to the USS Ronald Reagan where she had life-saving surgery. The cost, I guess this is according to the government, it's reported, $2.5 million. That was, they said that was per day, so I guess however long she was on the ship, maybe. $2.5 million. That's a lot of money, isn't it? It was worth it for the parents. And that, at least at that point in time, to the government, she was worth it, right? Or at least whoever was on the U.S., who was running the, the ship on the USS Ronald Reagan. You think about that. One person, $2.5 million a day to, to save her. That was a high price. The government believes she's worth it. But I want you to consider the fact that God has paid a much, much, much higher price for you to obtain our allegiance, if you will, so that we could choose to love Him in return. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. God gave His very best. He gave His only Son, His one unique Son, one of a kind Son for you and me. Even though He loved His Son, He chose to give His Son because He also loved the world and because He also loves you and me. Well, who can have eternal life? For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him, whoever, whosoever, who does that include? Every man everywhere, every woman everywhere, everyone. The gospel is for the whole creation. Remember what Jesus said to his apostles in, in Mark chapter 16 and verse 15? Go into the, all the world and proclaim the gospel to who? The whole creation. It's available to everyone. But belief in Jesus is the condition for eternal life, or one of the conditions for eternal life. Belief here is not a one-time belief. It's not a one-time saying, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. But it is a continued belief. It's believing in Jesus it, as it, it, it's, it's a way of life for us. And, and it begins to, to dictate how we live and how we think. And how we, we determine and make decisions in our lives. It's putting our complete trust in our Lord and in Jesus Christ. That's what it means to believe in Jesus. It means giving Him our life, turning over our life to Him. It's interesting that in John's gospel account, as, as you look through uh, John's gospel or his gospel account, how many times do you find the word believe? I think you find it over right around 100 times, just that one word believe. And we see that that's the purpose, really, of, of why he wrote the book, because you get to, towards the end of the book, in John chapter 20, in, in verse 31, where he says, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. I want you to notice some things, actually three things, about what it means to believe in Jesus. And, and we could we could say a lot of other things and find a lot of other things in just in John probably, but I just want to look at three things for a moment. Number one, if you believe, believe in Jesus, then you receive Jesus. In John chapter 1 and verse 12, But to all who did receive Him, who believed in His name, He gave the right to become children of God. Sometimes we hear that word or that, that phrase, receive Jesus or accept Jesus. That's not just saying one thing one time in the history of our life, right? That is an attitude towards Him that we are accepting Him as our Savior, but we're also accepting Him as the master of our life because of what He's done. So we become His slave. We make ourselves His slave. We receive Him, if you will, as our master. We're, his, we're the children of God who follow Jesus Christ, His Son. Not only do you receive Jesus if you believe in Him, but you obey Jesus. Now listen to John chapter 3, verse 36. 
John 3, verse 36, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains in him. What's associated with belief here? Obedience. Obeying Jesus. Ultimately, we're going to see also part of that is you, you're removed or God removes you from His wrath when you choose to obey Him. So you receive Jesus, you obey Jesus, and then chapter 6, verse 35, you come to Jesus. If you believe in Jesus, you're, you're going to come to Jesus. You're going to follow Him. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. A lot of people have heard about Jesus. Many people maybe have heard the truth about Jesus. But many who have heard him and know about him have chosen not to come to him and follow him. So if you believe, you're going to receive, you're going to obey, you're going to come to Jesus. Whoever has belief that leads them to receive and accept Jesus, obey him and come to Jesus, are those who can receive eternal life. What about the reward? The reward. For those who believe in Jesus, whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal or everlasting life. So when our belief in Jesus causes us to receive him, to obey him, to to come to him, then we're saved from having to perish. We're saved from ruin. We're saved from being delivered up to eternal misery, eternal separation from God. We're delivered from His wrath that we deserve because of our sin. We're saved from the wrath of the Lord. And I think sometimes, I don't know if I I really consider enough the wrath of God and what that means and what it means to be saved from His wrath, right? What it means to be removed from His wrath. Turn over with me just for a moment to 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. And look with me at verses 7 through 9. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, starting in verse 7. And to give relief to you who are afflicted, and to us as well, when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with His mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. So those who don't know God, who who didn't obey the gospel, will perish. They're going to suffer eternal destruction away from God. But those whose belief did lead them to obey God and trust in Jesus and to live for Him, there's a great reward of eternal life. Eternal life. Communion with God forever. The presence of God and all the saints forever and ever. It's a state of glory. It's a state of eternal rest. It's a state of eternal joy that we need to hold on to. We need to set our hearts on. And we need to keep focused on that and help those around us Remain focused on that. A grandfather found his grandson jumping up and down in his playpen. He's crying at the top of his voice. Johnny saw his grandfather walk in. And he reached up his chubby little hands and he said, Gramps, out, out, Gramps. And so naturally, Grandpa started to reach down and pull him out, but he could hear Mom, no, 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 no. Now, Johnny, you know you're in trouble, and you need to stay in the pen. The grandfather, it's kind of a tough situation, right? I mean, he wants to pick up his grandson. He loves his grandson, but he also knows his daughter is trying to teach his grandson a lesson. He couldn't pull him out of that that pen. So what did he do? He decided to get in the pen with him. (laughs) In a way, in a very real way. I think we could say that's kind of what God's done for us and with us. God didn't keep Daniel in the lion's den, but God was with him in the lion's den, wasn't he? God didn't keep Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego out of that fiery furnace, but God was with them in that fiery furnace. 
God didn't take us out of a sinful world. But He did come in the flesh to be with us, to be with man for a time, to live, to love, to suffer, to die, to be raised for us so that we might have the opportunity to overcome this sinful world. God is the one who provided the gift. He provided it because He loves you. He provided it for the world. The gift was the very best. very best that He could have given to you and me. And all those who believe, continue to believe in His Son, shall not perish, but have eternal life. John 3.16, it's not just a sign to be read at a sporting event. It's not just a slogan to think about ever so often. It's the truth about our God who's gone to great lengths to show you and I and to show the world His love and to provide eternal life for a lost and dying world. We'll close with 1 John 3, verse 1. 1 John 3, verse 1. The first part of that verse says, See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. Jesus became flesh, and He dwelt among us, and He gave His life on the cross for every one of us. The question we want to close with this evening, what has been my response to that? And I know you're sitting there thinking, man, hey, we're here on a Wednesday night. What are you talking about? You know my response. (laughs) But I really want you to think about that because there's more to it in there just coming to sit in a pew and listen to some dumb guy from southwest Oklahoma. It's about have we really made Jesus our master because of what he's done for us? Have I really turned over my life to him? Because that love that God showed us, right, and what we just read and studied in John 3, 16, that demands a response. Now, certainly, my response can be, I guess, no response. But if I begin to get that, and I begin to understand more and more what God has done, and how He's done it, and the love that it took to give the gift what He gave, then the only response I have is to trust Him completely with my life. We're not going to offer an invitation. We're going to have a prayer. But maybe as we pray, maybe you need to talk to God about where you're at in your life, just to maybe more devoted commitment to Him. Maybe refocus priorities a little bit. Or maybe start looking outside these walls more and more. I know you guys are doing that. Some of you guys are, I mean, you're doing great things here. Certainly we don't want to rest on our laurels, right? We want to continue to be growing. We want to continue. There's, There's a lot of people out there that need our Lord and need to know this love. So maybe we just ask God to help us be more and more committed to sharing what we have with others. Or maybe we just need to ask God to help us be more appreciative of what He's given us. Thank you for allowing me to be here tonight. Uh, God is good all the time. All the time God is good. And uh, it's good that I've been able to be with you this evening. Let's pray. Almighty God, our eternal Father in heaven, you uh, you are an amazing God. And we thank you that in all your greatness, you allow us, you give us the privilege and honor to call you Father. Thank you, Father, for giving us your son, Jesus. And it's something that we know, we've heard it all our lives, but I know, Father, I I pray you forgive me for taking that for granted far too often. Help me to be more committed, uh, to be more thoughtful, uh, more um, cognizant of uh, the blessing that you have given, the gift that you have given to purchase our eternal life. Thank you for allowing us to be able to live this life as your people and to have hope as we live this life of an eternity with you. But Father, also help us to remember that we're not Christians now just so we get to heaven. We're Christians now because you, you want us to share what we've been given. 
And Father, we need your help in that because we can't do that on our own. We all have different talents. We all have different gifts. But Father, whatever those are, help us to use whatever we have and what you bless us with, no matter what it is, to honor you, to share your truth, and to share, Father, this truth about the Son that you've given to the world so that we might not perish, but we might have eternal life. We thank you. We praise you. We pray you help us, Father, to live every day looking to eternity and helping others look to eternity. To Jesus Christ, your, his precious name that we pray. Amen.